All right, good morning, everyone. I'm the session chair for this morning, and I will be ruling with an iron fist on instructions of organizers. So <laughs> Alyssa will be our first speaker giving a review talk on clouds, filaments, and fields. Good morning, everyone. Let me turn this on. Let's see. So good morning again. Now you can hear me. Um, Thank you all for coming back. And I'd like to definitely uh, start by thanking the organizers and saying, really, to the organizers. So the thank you is for having this fantastic meeting. And I need to thank Dick and Carl, these little notes they can read later. Um, and the are you serious part was we went back and forth what I was supposed to talk about. And in the end, it was something to the effect of could you talk about the atomic interstellar medium, the molecular interstellar medium, how they're connected, what Carl did about that, only a little of what Dick did about that, because you're not supposed to talk about magnetic fields, and throw in a lot of personal stories about Dick and Carl, and oh yeah, don't forget the magnet, oh don't really talk about the magnetic field, and uh, something about statistics and visualization, and could you please do this in 40 minutes? 35, 45. 35 minutes. <laughs> So I'll do as much of that as I possibly can um, in, uh, OK, Doug, 35 minutes, OK? <laughs> and so the first thing is, I thought your favorite color was orange, Carl, not pink. Because um, I remember your office being orange. So anyway, there's a lot of orange in this talk, um, just for you. So I'll talk about two different kinds of connections. Uh, I'll start mostly talking about connections between people. And then I'll talk about connections in different parts of the atomic and molecular ISM as requested. So here are our two protagonists in this story. And we're going to use, if you don't know what this is, this is something called Google Ngrams, where you can have a tremendous amount of fun looking at how words have been used in all of the books that are indexed by Google over the last, well, since 1840. Um, Carl and Dick were born significantly after 1840, um, in you know the 1940 zone there, and uh, you know time went by. And oh wait, so we should just explain. Here's interstellar medium as a search. Something bad happens around here, uh, and here's <laughs> here's molecular cloud. Okay. By the way, what happens is the internet, and we all stop using books. But we'll make it a different story. <laughs> Sorry. Spitzer died. Spitzer died too, yeah. Anyway, OK. But importantly, if we, if we change to magnetic fields, which is the subject for love of many people in this room, it still shows up. A lot of, a lot of words don't even show up on a, on a plot like this. So this is good. OK, but let's let um, Dick and Carl get PhDs here um, in the 60s. And uh, let's see why it is that if I'm not supposed to talk so much about magnetic fields, I'm going to talk more about Carl than about Dick. And the reason is because Carl, I mean Dick, uh, tried to measure magnetic fields here in 1981. This is red because it didn't work. Okay, so he went back, did some more stuff about the interstellar medium in 1982, but he didn't give up. And in 1983, uh, this actually worked. And he detected the Zeeman effect in OH absorption. And it was over um, after that. Okay. <laughs> So um, I, too, had an interest in magnetic fields. I'll explain why in a minute. But so I come along, and I get a PhD, and look what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying, OK? Anyway, so what happened? Why, why was I interested in magnetic fields? And how did I come to know Carl and Dick? So in 1983, uh, I was lucky enough to have what, used, what is now called an RAU. It wasn't called an RAU then, but it was at Columbia at the branch of the Goddard Institute of Space Science that was there uh, where Pat Thaddeus was. I never actually met Pat Thaddeus. He assigned me as a student to Tom Dame, who was very busy finishing his thesis, who actually gave me to Richard Cohen, who was going to Chile to set up a telescope, so he gave me to Ron Maddalena. Okay. <laughs> So Ron had just made this map of Orion in CO and said, you know, there's this way to look at the magnetic field, and I think that might be important. And so can you go get all of the optical polarization data in the literature since 1951, and we'll make a polarization map of Orion, which we did, but I'm not going to show it to you today. 
Um, it, by the way, shows that the field goes around Barnard's loop and has nothing to do with the dense gas. So we actually knew this answer in 1983, but never mind. OK, so I go back to MIT, and I have to do a senior thesis. And I go to the one physicist I know well, who's Philip Morris, and who I had taken a freshman seminar from. And I say, you know, this polarization thing is kind of confusing. And I don't think anybody really understands how these grains align, which many of us know. Alex, sorry, but we still don't. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> so, so I got to do something about that. He's like, well, I don't know anything about that, but there's this really smart guy next door, and he doesn't know anything about it any either, but um, I can make him do anything. And so his name is Charles Alcock, who, for those of you who don't know, is now the director of the institution where I work, but he was my undergraduate thesis advisor. Um, so anyway, I write a thesis about grain alignment, and I'm still interested in magnetic fields, but I go work for this guy, Phil Myers, as a graduate student at Harvard. Still doesn't care at all about magnetic fields. So I try and I try to get him interested. He's not interested. One day, Steve Strom comes and gives a colloquium. And he gives this colloquium where he shows like three or four outflows that have been discovered in Orion and says they're <coughs> aligned with the magnetic field. Dick remembers this. And, and it's like within 30 degrees. And it's like three things. And it's like statistically, that doesn't mean anything. And so I'm like this upstart graduate student. And I get encouraged by another graduate student to raise my hand in the colloquium. And I say, uh, I don't understand. It doesn't seem to mean anything. And, and the next day, I wind up in Phil's office with Steve Strom, basically, I thought, getting scolded, but instead uh, getting sent to do polarization observations with none other than my good friend and collaborator, Mark Heyer, who was also a graduate student then. By the way, I'm telling this story at the request of some of the young people in the audience because apparently they like ancient history like this. So anyway, so Mark and I go, and we try and make some polarization maps, and it doesn't work. So ultimately, sorry, we consult an expert, Pierre Bastien, who has a wonderful system, which, by the way, involved photomultiplier tubes, not CCDs. Um, and we make a bunch of polarization maps, um, some of which you've seen included in the compilations that you've seen so far. And we decide that the magnetic field direction is not uh, either parallel or perpendicular to the dark filaments. Okay? Uh, we'll get an update on that later from others. Okay, and then where does Carl come into this story? Okay, so I finally convinced Phil that magnetic fields are interesting. We write a couple of papers together with no new data in them, and I say we've got to go measure something. So, so Phil introduces me to Carl. I was recounting for Carl the other day that this took place, uh, our first meeting on a ski lift at Lake Tahoe, which is perhaps characteristic of Carl's meeting style. Um, anyway, so, so Carl introduces me to all his friends, uh, some of whom are here today. And uh, we go out and measure the Zeeman effect uh, at Arecibo in a molecular cloud in a mission. And we see that the magnetic field is actually in this one cloud, B1, uh, consistent with EQ partition. And Phil Myers tells me I can get a PhD then. And that's kind of the end of the story there. Except um, then a lot of other people get involved. And I am no way going to try to explain this. And there's like a lot of people left out. <clears throat> but generally, this is sort of the legacy of Carl. And these people, a lot of these people are here today. And in little bits, I'm going to feature um, some of their work uh, as I go on. And so let's start with Chat. Where's Chat? There he is. So Chat's going to talk to you about some beautiful ALMA polarimetry uh, later in this week. And uh, we were, um, if you remember, I was complaining to Steve Strom about misalignment of outflows in magnetic fields. And look at the title of this paper, Misalignment of Magnetic Fields and Outflows. And this is from 2013. Okay? But Chat is going to tell you that finally, maybe, he and other people have found alignment at the very tiny scales. Okay? So when we talk about connections, one of the things that I want to say is that the environment of all of these very dense things certainly matters, okay? But the magnetic field connecting the very low density gas to the very high density gas is not a simple story, okay? It's obviously the same magnetic field at some level, but there's a lot of twists and turns, and looking for systematic alignment on very large scales having to do with processes on very small scales may be a misguided idea. And chat will say more about that. Okay, so the update on the polarization alignment. Um, you've heard a lot of people talk about this, and some people talk about um, the Planck results, which actually show that the statistical trend here of alignment okay, becomes more striking for increasing polarization fraction and decreasing column density, 
meaning that this very wispy stuff that I'll show you in an illustration in a few minutes is very nicely aligned with the field, kind of the way that Josh showed you in the H1 yesterday, but the dense stuff remains poorly aligned with the magnetic field, like we said um, in 1990. So again, looking at things on very large scales and assuming that they apply to the scales within is, is not a good idea. OK, and then Dick has uh, done a tremendous job with Tom and Carl and other collaborators on <laughs> continuing to measure magnetic field strengths in molecular clouds. And he's built up a database um, that is analyzed statistically in this uh, paper from 2010 that concludes um, that, here we go, many fields are so weak that the mass to flux ratio of many clouds must be significantly supercritical. A two-thirds power law comes from isotropic contraction of gas too weakly magnetized for the magnetic field to affect the morphology of the collapse. So that's not equipartition. On the other hand, our study does not rule out some clouds having strong magnetic fields with critical mass to flux ratios. So I'll leave that to the next two days. Um, but basically, it means sometimes yes, sometimes no for the magnetic field. And it's important to figure out which is the time. All right, so there's uh, the connections between people. Let's talk more now about connections in the interstellar medium. So I love this image. This is actually from 1918. I think it was taken in 1906, so more than 100 years ago, by Barnard. And is there any way to turn the lights down anymore, a little bit? If, if we can dim the lights anymore, uh, you'll be able to see even more of the filamentary structure in this image. And that would be fun, so let's wait just a second. I don't know which way. Is that would be the wrong way. <laughs> now it looks like blobs. I'm making my point, OK? If you have poor resolution and sensitivity, these things look like blobs. OK, maybe not. Okay, can you put it back the way it was? Maybe I can do off. Ooh, ah. All right, excellent. OK, so now you all see the wonderful filamentary structure. And yes, Carl, we will come back to Hylus Cloud 2 in a few minutes. Okay, um, but let me just show you now uh, what the interstellar medium looks like according to Herschel. And if this was a regular molecular cloud meeting, I would spend a tremendous amount of time talking about Herschel. And so I apologize to those of you who love the 0.1 parsec filament wide filaments and all of those things that I'm not actually going to talk about that very much at all today. Should I bring them back up? Should we leave it so you can see the slides better? You like it the other way? Okay, I promise not to put you to sleep. Put them back. Can you turn them off? Oh, thank you. Somebody did that. OK, great. Now, if anybody falls asleep, I'm going to break that promise. So don't do that. OK? Anyway, all right. So here's 100 years. But the point is you could see these filaments. All right? This was clear in 1918. And somehow, in between here and here, there was some amount of amnesia. Um, but we'll get back to that in a second. OK? Instead, what I want to show you is what happens when you connect 1918 and Taurus filaments to 1974. We'll see the context of this image later, but this is Carl's OH mapping of um, Hylus Cloud 2 in Taurus. And then what happens when you try to make these connections between the magnetic field at large scales and density structure at many scales? So let's just take a look at some real data here for the first time. Um, I have to play with this, so give me just a second. OK, so here, this is going to be a movie. And what you're going to see is this structure here, the sort of dark structure, is showing you what people normally think of for the aficionados as the way that the Taurus molecular clouds work, uh, what the way that they look. And we've heard many times in the last uh, day that it's really, really important to look at velocity structure. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to slide through. This is the beautiful FCRIO mapping of, um, of Taurus that was published by Narayanan. And I'm going to slide through the velocity channels. And you're going to look at the polarization vectors uh, that are superimposed here, giving you an idea of what I think is the magnetic field in the very low density gas. I'm going to control this so that you can see now. What I want you to look at is first, I'll just do it very, very fast. Okay? And you'll see, like, oh, god, that looks like a mess. What does that mean? All right? And also, you'll see, don't even look at the polarization for the moment. You'll see that if you look in the middle here, oops, hang on. Look in the middle, you see these vertical filaments, OK, which are not the classic kind of more diagonal filaments that you saw before. So there's all this structure that's hidden in the velocity that you don't see in integrated maps. But the most important thing, OK, for our purposes is if you look at the magnetic field direction in this region up here, and then you look very carefully 
at this kind of wispy stuff right up in here. There are little tiny hints that what's going on is that the magnetic field may have kind of random orientations with respect to these big dark clouds, but actually is very well aligned with the very low density structure. And you can see that, oops, sorry, you can see that much better in this image that was produced in a paper by my polarization friend Mark Heyer um, and, and friends, uh, where you see uh, the stretch changed in the CO maps to bring out these little striations in the very low density gas. And this is reminiscent of what Josh showed us in the H1. I hope that there's discussion. Unfortunately, I won't be here later this week when this discussion happens. But I hope that there'll be some discussion of whether you don't see alignment at certain higher density scales because there's bad grain alignment or because the field is actually not aligned with density structures. But I'll leave that subject at that for now. Okay? So instead, I want to have a little bit more fun um, putting this in modern context. So for those of you who don't know, there's this wonderful tool that the American Astronomical Society has just acquired called Worldwide Telescope. So this is a free and open source tool that will let you do things. Uh, like what I am about to do. No, not get grants from the Sloan Foundation. Sorry, I clicked too quickly. <laughs> I'll do that one more time. Okay. Here we go. There's a stale browser. Okay, so here's Barnard's image, and I can do this with any image that has stars in it. I can actually solve it. And by the way, the American Astronomical Society, Zooniverse, and our group at Harvard, the Seamless Astronomy Group, are collaborating. Uh, through something called the ADS All Sky Survey to put all the images in all of ADS back on the sky, not just this one from Barnard's paper in 1918. So this is where it goes. And just for fun, Doug, let's put the SFD dust map in the background. And so we can go back and forth between this optical image and an infrared image. I could put the Planck thermal dust in here. And clearly, we should put the Galpha data in here. And we'll, we'll look at how you can slide in velocity later. And just for fun, I should mention that you can do this. And you can right click. And then anywhere uh, in the sky, you can you know, look up any object you want on Simbad. Or you can look up all the papers that have been written about that part of the sky. But that's a different talk. Um, so I'm going to stop with that for now. But I'm just going to say that we have amazing opportunities now. I think Ron was saying yesterday that the data have gotten so large that we really have to make the access and visualization tools better. And so hopefully I'll have time and I'll come back to that uh, point at the end of the talk. But let's go back to where we were uh, looking in the context of connections between people and, and clouds. So here's the 100 years between uh, uh, Barnard and, and Herschel. And here we have, again, Dick and Carl. So I thought it would be fun to look at trends um, in the period of their academic careers so far. And I thought it would be very important not to show all t-shirts, <laughs> but instead to look at fashions of the times. Okay? Now don't worry. Some of you are looking very worried. Is she serious? Is she actually going to analyze fashion styles? No, I'm going to analyze the fashions of what we called clouds and what kind of structures were discovered at what time. Now, there's this word clouds, which is very unfortunate, because when people think of clouds, they mostly think of the kind of white, fluffy clouds that little children draw in the sky in their pictures. And when we had very low resolution, that was what molecular clouds look like. Okay? They now look like the Herschel cloud um, that I showed you before. And there's a question, a really big question, of how much all that internal structure matters. But let's look at the decades a different way. And Let's take a look here at um, some of uh, Carl's early mapping of OH. This is the Ophiuchus complex, for those of you who don't recognize it. Uh, I would rather you didn't, but do we want the lights on or off? Just shout. OK, well, we have to sacrifice seeing the slides a little for the video recording. So go ahead, turn them back on. <laughs> OK. The slides are the most important part. Yeah, well. There's a hundred and something of us who agree, but um, not the video people. So sorry. <laughs> anyway, all right. So anyway, so here we go. So we have now you get the idea where there are these clouds. But e even here in Ophiuchus, you see that there are very filamentary shapes. But um, Carl starts talking about sheets, possible 
and cloudlets, small clouds, smaller than what had seen, been seen before, because these are molecular clouds, so they're smaller than the atomic clouds. Then we heard a lot uh, yesterday about shells and supershells and about filaments. So this is work from the 1970s. And Carl, I, I chose to feature your highly original, amazing, colored velocity image. This is the actual image from Carl's paper in the 1970s. And then you get to these amazing uh, worm-like structures in the 80s. And we start talking about aligned magnetic fields and H1 structure for the first time. We saw this yesterday, the 1990s, where we start looking at magnetic fields in H1 around molecular clouds. So this is Orion. And as Carl also starts talking about tiny scale structure. And I'm sorry, but crazy things like helical magnetic fields. Um, OK, maybe it's true. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> the word clouds is not really, it's in everyone else's vocabulary all the time. But the point I'm trying to make is that Carl is talking about all these other interesting geometries, mostly in the H1. And the molecular cloud community was largely, I'm sorry, but not listening. Okay. In the 2000s, um, that's when the very first Galfa data uh, started coming out. And again, we start hearing about sheets and filaments. And then you also heard yesterday um, from Jay Lachman and others about these compact clouds of, of H1, which are now these very small things that, again, look like little round blobs. So what does this all mean? I'm not really sure, except that there are these sort of gross structures that still look like you know, big concentrations of gas. And then there's all this substructure inside of them. And to me, the really interesting part is both, both parts of that. How did the big structures get there in the context of the galaxy? And then how was all of this structure um, inside of them caused? The theorists don't always agree. And with apologies to the theorists in the room, I'm going to give a very, very oversimplified view of the theory verse. But then I'm going to go to the more complicated theory verse. So just, just be patient for five minutes. All right, so here's the universe according to theorists. Okay. So we have mostly dark matter and some baryons and some dark energy that you know, we don't understand um, here in this blue universe. By the way, this is a heel picks projection for you, Doug. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so. Anyway, so um, inside of that, there's some structure formation that happens. And there's a network of filaments. Um, and at the intersections of these filaments, there are these things we call galaxies. And this stuff in between, we're just going to call the intergalactic medium. And obviously, it's actually very interesting to know how the material from the intergalactic medium gets into the galaxies. And we talked about that a little bit yesterday. But in terms of terminology, what happens is that those Outer things just get called clouds, sorry, they just get called galaxies. And then inside of them, there are these clouds that are arranged into vaguely spiral patterns in some galaxies. There are these mysterious regions containing black holes and AGN and weird jets uh, that we will uh, call galactic centers and ignore for the rest of today. Um, but if we go inside the cloud, and this is where I have to extra apologize to Chris, but here we go. All right. So we have a cloud with an atomic layer on the outside, molecular gas inside, the infamous hot, warm, ionized medium, a warm neutral medium, a warm neutral medium, a cold neutral medium, a miraculous blob of dense molecular gas in the middle with some ionized gas caused by this uh, massive star uh, forming in the middle. Do you know that this looks kind of like the Captain America shield? I didn't do that on purpose. But then afterwards, I was like, ha. Huh. OK, anyway, so Captain America here was a, a very good model and probably still is for the kind of microphysics at some level of, of a region right around a, a massive forming star. But it's a very bad model for the overall structure of the interstellar medium. So here's the new theory verse. OK, things have gotten a lot better. These are two models of whole galaxies. We'll come back to this one a little bit later. This is a very interesting paper published by Smith and collaborators a couple years ago now that shows the difference between CO emitting gas in purple and other uh, dense gas in gray. Um, this is a new paper by uh, Duarte Cabral and uh, Dobbs, very new paper uh, that actually talks about filaments uh, on very large scales and where they come from. I'm not going to have time to say much about that today. This is an amazing uh, optical uh, synthetic image uh, the, of, of something like a massive star forming region that you would see with Hubble um, in the Hubble colors. And I want to talk about making these kind of synthetic maps um, in a minute. But before I do that, let's take a look back at the, the Carl verse again 
And I want to focus on this paper from 1974 with the title that says, A Modern Look at Interstellar Clouds, because it is a modern look at, at interstellar clouds 40 years plus later. Okay, so what did Carl say? He said, many aspects of the interstellar cloud model are invalid. I just have to say that one of the things I learned from Carl when I was a postdoc at Berkeley is almost, not quite, but almost how to write like that. Okay. I think we all appreciate that, Carl. And my plea to the rest of you is try to have really short, direct, honest sentences like that. OK, the maps do reveal large, coherent gas structures, which are often <coughs> filamentary in shape. This is 1974. And at least sometimes aligned parallel to the interstellar magnetic field. Maps of H1 column density over small velocity ranges show much small scale structure, often filamentary in shape. The filaments are almost universally oriented parallel to the interstellar magnetic field. Okay. But importantly, um, in the paper, it says, many large aggregates contain hierarchical structure with non-random shapes and velocities. Outside these aggregates, the gas is often distributed in long, delicate, interconnected filaments rather than clouds. So Carl talks about two things that I want to talk a little bit more about um, this morning, hierarchical structure and filaments rather than clouds. OK. So this is where I'm going to show you some modern data. And luckily, Josh showed you uh, and, and Susan uh, a lot of the uh, H1 data yesterday. So I'll just remind you that we have this exquisite um, map of, of filamentary structure in the H1, which is aligned tremendously well with magnetic fields. And so again, I think that this idea that in the very low density interstellar medium, the large scale magnetic fields we can measure are uh, seeming to be aligned with density structures. OK, so now I have to cover what would be two colloquia in like five minutes, just to give you an example of the kind of work um, that people are talking about now involving filaments. And so there's a proposal on the table in Europe to get a very large center to study filaments. And I was asked to go to this meeting and talk about our work on filaments. And so I have like eight slides here to just show you um, what actually was discussed. Okay? So the first topic was uh, something that we now call bones or dark, uh, long filaments in the Milky Way. And the idea is that we can actually find lots and lots of these very long, skinny clouds that turn out to lie in the galactic plane kind of spookily exactly. I'll explain in a minute. Bob Benjamin mentioned this yesterday. And perhaps um, add a technique for mapping out the very detailed structure of the dense gas in the galactic plane. So just uh, for the aficionados, I want to show you the actual data. Um, you can just look at one of these images. It doesn't really matter which one. Um, there's an interesting problem that uh, is an interesting and long story. But if you put the, um, the cloud that I was just showing you, which is called Messy, in context, this is it here. If the lights were off, you'd be able to see it better. But trust me, there's a long, stringy cloud here. And it actually continues for a great distance. I'll zoom in in a minute. What's interesting is that you notice it's not at zero of galactic latitude. Trick question, how many people think that the galactic plane is at zero of galactic latitude? See, I told you it was a trick question. Yesterday, you would have all said yes. <laughs> okay. The answer is no. At three kiloparsecs, it about, it's at about minus 0.4 degrees. And so this dashed line is actually the galactic plane projected onto the sky. And these two colored solid lines are plus and minus 20 parsecs from the galactic plane at three kiloparsecs. Okay? So this thing, whatever it is, is very much in the galactic plane if it's at that distance. And in fact, um, these colored lines are colored by the velocity you would expect for a rotation curve at that distance. And if you zoom in on the cloud itself, you'll notice that these colors are the velocities that match the predicted velocities from a rotation curve. And you notice that these other dark cloud points don't match. Okay? So there's this tremendously coherent structure in velocity that lies on the sky and in velocity space exactly where it should be if it was basically the spine of the Scutum Centaurus arm. So long story short, we think we can find lots more of these. Uh, a great student who's working with Doug Finkbeiner and me uh, has found many more candidates. This is them on a position velocity diagram of CO. This is their properties. But I'll just make one more point about them, which is that you really need to investigate their velocity structure very carefully and not decide that any long, skinny cloud is one of these things that's telling you something about the plane and the structure of the galaxy. And this is just an example of one of the filaments in a recent paper by 
Catherine Zucker, where this is what it looks like in the Spitzer 8 microns. And if you look at a position velocity diagram along the section that we say is one of these bones, it's incredibly flat. Okay? It's all at the same velocity. But if you look here, this is a paper, this is from a paper uh, by um, work by Sarah Reagan et al, where they actually take this whole thing as the filament and they conclude that its velocity, they connect this point and this point, and then they decide that the velocity is actually like that and that it's not aligned with what would be galactic rotation. But you notice that if you see that there's this coherent structure in velocity and not this part, okay, and you chose this part by choosing position, position, velocity space, you would get a whole different story. So for those of you who are interested in pursuing this, please be careful um, and be uh, sure to choose things that are one structure and velocity. So what I want to say in the last part of my presentation is something about um, comparing with simulations. And this is a simulation that fortunately came out right as this work about the bones was being done because there were no simulations that had anything like the resolution needed to see structures like that. Just so you know, that thing is less than a parsec wide and 500 or so parsecs long, okay, when you zoom in. It's crazy long. It's a thread lying in the galactic plane, okay? So it turns out that now simulations using adaptive mesh refinement, or repo simulations, can actually see structures like that. And that's a top-down view. And this is an edge-on view, again, with these 20 parsec lines superimposed. You'll notice here in gray, and you should talk to Bill Mox, who's here, about this, that this version of the simulation has no magnetic fields and no feedback, which is actually going to mess this up substantially. And so we're looking to see, when Rowan Smith does her next round of simulations, um, what she's going to predict. And in particular, these simulations do what's really important and make synthetic maps. This is the CO map I showed you before of the emission that you would expect to see that you can directly compare with observation. OK, so I'm going to go through this blazingly fast. Okay, I'm not going to explain what all of this is. I never show slides like this. Okay, I'm doing it now. But um, uh, this is just showing you the history of a particular molecular cloud core uh, work by several people showing simulations of how gas accretes onto a very small object. Uh, in this case, this object's called B5. And it's shown to be this isolated, velocity-coherent blob. And the part that we thought was important once upon a time was that it was cut off in velocity space from the material around it. It had a thermal velocity width. It was just a blob. It was the kind of thing that was going to make my friend Chris over there really happy. Okay? It was just like this isolated thing that might collapse. Okay? But here's what happened. Okay? So we started looking for connections. So this blue stuff is the highest density gas observed. Okay, so this is um, ammonia at the VLA. So this is densities of like 10 to the 5 particles per cubic centimeter. And you see these tiny little filaments, which interestingly are forming a very tiny cluster of stars, but that's a different story. Now, if you look here at the GBT data, so this is also ammonia data, and I'll just go back and forth, you can see that in context, those are part of some longer filament. But here's the scary part, okay? If you keep going, and you connect that to the Herschel map, hopefully, I don't know, with the lights, if you can see it, but there's this big, long filament, okay, of which that structure is part. And then, if you keep going, okay, and you look at just the VLA data and the Herschel data, you can even see, right, I can turn off, see that? You can see those filaments in the Herschel data alone. So in fact, there are these dense structures that seem to persist um, as remnants of something that was on a very large scale. So some of you have been to Boston, and you know that there used to be an elevated highway that went through Boston. And that elevated highway isn't there anymore. Instead, there's kind of a park. Okay? But it left a remnant. It left a scar of the larger pre-existing structure. And so it seems that what might be going on in cores today is that this structure on these huge scales, okay, these filaments on tens of parsec scales, may actually leave an imprint because star formation proceeds more rapidly than we thought on, on very small scales, not unlike this lovely park. OK, so Carl, I'm going to give you a little gift at the end. Um, and this is a preview of it. This is some software that friends and I have been working on. Um, that includes your friend Josh. It's called Glue, and it lets you link many different data sets together and connect attributes of those data sets, coordinates, intensities, whatever you want. Okay, And so I'm, again, not going to show you the details, but this is just an analysis of that B5 region using Glue with many different molecular line tracers, many different data sets, 
And here, you'll see that you can even have the kind of thing you always want, a three-dimensional visualization of position, position, velocity, space, looking at all the different tracers. Okay. So just to really make the point one more time, what you really want to do okay, is not just look at pictures like that, but actually make pictures like that from simulations and then have statistical analysis that will help you compare them. So here you go. So if you have a simulation and nature, you can directly compare them. You can just look at both of them. Okay? But we can't go to our nature. So instead, we need some kind of observing system. And then we come up with something like a map of a mission from a particular line. So to take a simulation to that point, you need to do radiative transfer. You need to do chemistry. And then you need to have a synthetic observing system. My clock says I have three minutes left. Um, anyway, synthetic observing system um, so that you have synthetic data with which you can compare and then you need to have statistical tests. Okay. So I really think that that is uh, the way forward. And if we take a look here, oh, I'm going to have to leave the ice cream out because Doug is standing over me. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, if you take a look at uh, recent H1 simulations, uh, recent uh, galactic simulations here uh, by Evo Stryker and colleagues, you'll see that they're actually producing uh, synthetic maps of H1. And so there's all kinds of amazing um, statistics to compare these synthetic observations with the data. But I'm going to skip them because Doug is standing over me. And instead, I'm going to skip to the very last part here. Oh, I would, OK, ask me about position, position, velocity, space, and what it really means. But I'm going to just say one, two more things about data and visualization, just for Carl. Okay, So if we add visualization here, you'll notice that it's come up in the recent past for reasons that Ron mentioned yesterday, basically that it's necessary now. And if you look at the difference, not only between Mario in the 1970 and 2014, but polarization maps, you notice that um, both large amounts of data and large amounts of compute um, can make a huge difference um, in what you can see. And I want to show you a very short movie um, in a second that shows you what happens when you can actually incorporate new technologies into scientific communication. This is a paper by Tom Rice uh, presenting a new catalog of clouds in the Milky Way. And I'll show you the movie in just one second. But I just want to say that Included in it is a machine-readable table of all of the hierarchical decomposition that's been done. So uh, I'm going to skip the movie for just a second. And I'm just going to uh, show you something from Carl. And I'll come back to the movie in a minute. So I said to Carl last week, I said, I'd really like to put your bursting and highless map in some of these modern tools. Do you have some kind of digital copy of it? Even just an image that's all in one piece instead of lots of these little pieces. And Carl wrote back, Alyssa, you must be dreaming. Heel picks in 1981 even fits. I don't recall how I made this. And then he goes on and on about a CalComp plotter, et cetera. But Doug over there and friends, turns out, had digitized the bursting and highless map. Turns out you can even put it in this glue software. So as a gift for you, Carl. I actually have the bursting and highless map and anything else you want put into this uh, glue software. And for the rest of you, I just wanted to show you that there's a bonus gift available if you buy now. Um, and what that lets you do is you can make, sure, you can make position velocity diagrams of galaxies and things like that. But you can also zoom in, make a spectrum, make a composite spectrum. OK, this is all stuff you can do in other software. But then you can trace along any particular structure of interest. And then you can make a position velocity diagram along that structure and interact with that to understand the other dimensions of your data and connect it to other data sets as well. So the last thing I'm going to do is show you that movie and show you, it's one minute long, uh, how you can um, communicate this kind of visualization. In their 2016 analysis, Rice et al. created an extensive catalog of molecular clouds in the Milky Way by using a dendrogram of CO emission. They derived distances to these clouds through a galactic rotation curve. However, you'll see that there's a small gap in the region near our Sun. Here, random motions of nearby clouds dominate large-scale kinematic motion, preventing Rice et al. from computing distances accurately. To complement their work, 
we use a recent catalog of photometric distance data. By combining a CO dendrogram and these photometric distances, we uniformly catalog the locations and properties of 16 local, high-latitude molecular clouds. In our paper, we show that the properties of these molecular clouds are representative of those across the Milky Way. And that is that. Thank you very much. Um, one quick question while we have the next person come set up. Um, Chris. Yes, uh, the bones are infrared dark clouds. Uh, they are special infrared dark clouds. And so thank you very much for Glimpse, Dr. Churchwell. So you can search all of Glimpse. Um, and that actually is how these things, so Jim Jackson discovered NASI as an 80 parsec long, less than a parsec wide infrared dark cloud. And then what I didn't have time to explain is that if you look at the context of the whole Glimpse survey, that turns out to be much longer. And this turns out to be true for a lot of infrared dark clouds, but certainly not for all of them. And so what I was saying is that you need to look very carefully at which ones are long and skinny in the right position where they might have something to do with the galactic plane, and then look at the uh, velocity what structure. What fraction of the infrared dark clouds are in the bone? Um, I don't know the answer to that yet. We will know the answer to that soon. The problem is that it's hard to define what one long skinny structure is. But if you looked at structures that are, say, more than 50 parsecs long, it's going to be a very large fraction. But if you look at everything in a catalog, like Pareto and Fuller, it's going to be a tiny fraction, like 2%. Okay, that's Mike Alyssa again.